And perhaps now would be a good time just to talk a little bit about my history with gambling and how I got my, my relationship, my addiction to gambling became so entrenched. So backtracking a little bit, you know, my mum, you know, she, I remember we, we, we worked in a number of, my mum worked in a number of pubs and I remember seeing the fruit machines and I remember being turned on by those machines. I was really curious. I've always been curious. I remain being curious. So I think there's a good place of being curious. I think it's a good quality. But in this instance, you know, I was, I was wrongly curious towards gambling. And, and I remember I just wanted to play on these machines. And I found that the early experience of playing these fruit machines as a child, you know, some, something happened. You know, just like with the alcohol and the drugs, you know, I could forget by playing a fruit machine, I could forget about all the problems that was going on in my life. And I remember as well, you know, I, 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 I remember I'm thinking if I can learn how to play this fruit machine, then I can profit from it. So that was my th way of thinking. To this day, I think, you know, I th feel I developed, established unhelpful ways of thinking that became real strong beliefs that I had towards gambling. And they provided the basis for a very, very strong relationship with gambling going forwards. Um, so here I am, I'm thinking, you know, I, I want to learn how to play fruit machines. I want to um, pro and profit from them. So I want to profit from gambling. And so that's that's a that's a line of inquiry I, I pursued. You know, it's something I wanted to do. It's exciting, it's fun. Again, when I think back to that, point in time of my life when I was a young teenager, a child and as a young teenager, you know, and given that, you know, all the relationships in my life at the time, you know, posed a threat to me, I, I, I saw relationships with people and I created that threat, you know, relationships were meant danger, it was unsafe, but, but with gambling, with fruit machines, you know, there was a safe element there, I felt safe in front of a fruit machine, you know, safe and secure, so, so gambling, also did something for me. Gambling it felt safe, it was secure, it gave me comfort, it gave me solace. So it, emotionally, emotionally, it, it did something for me which I wasn't getting in my other relationships at the time. And I do believe I, I developed a very strong attachment to gambling. And so, so yeah, so fast forward a little bit, you know, here I am, I'm at the back end of my uh, criminal justice system experience. Um, at 17, 18 this time, and I recall uh, whenever I had money, I would, I would, you know, be completely consumed in mental and physical tension and obsession, you know, I could not think about anything else other than to get my money and go to the nearest bookmakers or arcades and gamble my money. And there's absolutely categorically no concept of thinking why well, I, I don't have enough money, I can't gamble, um, I, I need to pay rent, there's, there's no concept of that, all that money, all money I had was gambling money. So, so that's what I did, you know, I would go to the nearest bookies or, or, or arcades and I would gamble until my less until my last money um, had gone and this is a common experience shared by millions of people across the country who've experienced problems with gambling and um, so yeah my, my early experiences my early frequency my, my early frequent experience of gambling was such that you know whenever I used to gamble I'd gamble to the point of exhaustion and have no money and so here I am you know at a very young age having to deal with the consequences of, of my gambling of having no money for food paying my rent and but this, the, the, the consequences of my gambling behaviour became such that, you know, they became my normal. You know, it was what I became very, very familiar with. You know, uh, always getting to a point where I have money, gamble it all, you know, and then arrive in a situation, I'm thinking of how I'm going to survive now, how am I going to pay my rent, how am I going to pay my food and things like that. Um, so, so, so for me, there was the, I never regard my relationship with gambling as a steady progression like some people's experiences my experience i think my my relationship with gambling became very pathological from from the word go there, there's no progression there's no escalation it it was it was it was a bad relationship from the start you know um so yeah um i began to experience problems with gambling then and um 
I decided I decided I want to build bridges with my dad. I haven't mentioned about my dad. If I, back, if I can backtrack just a little while, a few, a few years until I was about 16, just before I got thrown out, a dream came true. I met my dad for the first time of all days on Grand National Day. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a dream come true and it was a, it was a great day. We watched the race. Um, my dad had placed a bet. The, the horse won. Uh, I don't know what impact, if any, this experience did meeting my dad. This, this symbolic, this significance, the significant uh, nature of meeting my dad for the first time and, and on National Day and the horse winning. You know, perhaps subconsciously that told me that gambling is okay. It's given me the green light to do more gambling. Perhaps not, you know, but um, I do often wonder what impact that did have on my my attitude, my beliefs, my outlook on gambling. Um, so, yeah. So, so having met my dad, you know, and, you know, and now I'm 18 and 19, I, I decide I want to try and build a stronger relationship up with my dad. So I, I moved to Birmingham where he's living and I being a yellow belly, you know, um, the yellow belly being the name people were called back in the 19th century, I think back in rural Fenland, Lincolnshire. I, um, yeah, I moved to Birmingham and unannounced, which I probably shouldn't have done, uh, but I made myself, I, I decided um, to make myself uh, jobless and voluntary homeless. I didn't realise I was making those decisions at the time. All I wanted to do was just go to Birmingham and meet my dad. And uh, so that's what I did. And I, I, I arrived in Birmingham and yeah, this is meant to be uh, the, the, the beginnings of a fresh start. Um, so yeah, I'm thinking, you know, it, it didn't quite go so well because my dad he, um, we, we, we went casino gambling for the first time. And so just like when he introduced me to horses, I, or he, he, me and my dad went to the casino for the first time. That was my first ever casino experience. And I remember it being a completely new world to me, a totally new world. I'm thinking, wow, you know, this environment, the money, ev everything, everything that the, the your listeners, everything that we can think of um, associated with the casino, I was totally sucked into the casino environment. And I remember thinking, you know, why have I been playing fruit machines all this time when, when there's roulette and when there's blackjack? And just similar, quite similar to my experience of fruit machines, I'm thinking, well, you know, I think if I can apply these systems, this, these supposed systems to roulette, um, then I can profit from roulette. So here mark the beginning of my roulette chapter, you know. And this was coincided around the time fixed odds betting terminals began to appear with bookmakers. And this was such a significant, in my, in my opinion, such a significant moment in the, the, the most recent history, historic chapter of gambling in the UK. The, hit, the introduction of roulette to, to the British high streets, because I vividly recall acknowledging that, you know, pre-1999, 2000, 2001, um, you know, that in order to play roulette, you know, you had to go to a big city, you had to get dressed and you had to become a member of a casino in order to play roulette. But what the introduction of roulette onto the high street did and was, was made roulette um, accessible to the masses and you didn't need the membership you didn't need to get dressed you know you could just walk down your local ice straight and play roulette and roulette uh, for those for the listeners that don't know is regarded as a harder form of gambling as opposed to say for example um bingo for example but you know how hard a, um, a form of gambling is i guess is quite subjective so uh, so yeah but for me roulette, you know, that just took my gambling on a completely different path altogether so so here I am, you know, I'm, I'm in Birmingham, I'm trying to build bridges with my father and, you know, I, I began to go to casinos more regularly. And this is when I had my first ever big win. Let me just add some context to this. I grew up really, really poor with no money, no nothing. And so the pursuit, the dream, the fantasy of winning lots of money was really, really, really attractive to me. 
And so on this day, on this evening, I remember it very well. It's a Sunday before Christmas. Um, I think I was 19, 18 or 19. And I'm playing roulette uh, and it was a very severe experience. I won't go into detail because I don't want to glamorize the experience, but um, it was a very serial experience. And and over a few hours, I, 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 I ended up winning um, a, lot, a lot of money, a lot of money in contrast to my own experience of what a lot of money is. And I remember this, I remember the effects very well. I felt very confident, very powerful, very rich. You know, I had options, I had choices. And that's a really, I wouldn't describe it as, I would describe it as toxic. Um, but it, it was a very powerful experience. And, and I, I remember walking out of that casino so, so very, very high. What I realized now though was that, that them feelings, them very strong what I regard as positive emotions were false and were not based on any real good grounding or substance. It was just bit, there was just temporary, there was false, there was just, yeah, it's not good. Um, and so and yet again, another dream came true with winning this amount of money. My dream came true. I've always dreamed and fantasized of winning big and that dream came true that night. Um, but the, the, the effects of that big win and Throughout, throughout listening to people's stories, a lot of people have over the years have, have obviously won a lot of the money, and you know it's really, yeah, the, the, the people's experience of winning lots of money are there's a lot of similarities in between people's experiences. I think, and my experience was no not dissimilar. I treated myself, you know, um, to, to, from some of my winnings, but. In the end, all, I remember all that winning did was it just give me more reason, more drive to gamble even more in larger quantities. And it fueled that obsession to, to gamble more. I could not think about anything else. I was already obsessed, you know, but it drove that obsession even more acutely. And I remember all I did was just, I became fixated with the idea of going back into the same casino and losing all my money which is a very familiar tale and um, that's what happened to me i lost all that money and i remember feeling very 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 depressed and i decided you know i, I don't i don't want this anymore you know um, my dad wasn't my dad and i wasn't speaking at the time it wasn't speaking as much and um i i'm thinking i i I don't want this. I can't. I can't deal with these emotions or feelings. And so what I did, like I've done previously, when I decided to leave Wales, living at time in order to come to Birmingham to to see my dad, I decided that I want to go to um, Europe and find a job and do the young lad thing and travel around um, Europe. So again, I, I I latched onto this fantasy, the, the, this hope that helped me escape and cope with what. I was coming what that I was dealing with in terms of the big gambling loss and latching onto that fantasy of you know running away and, and living happily ever after in Europe you know that influenced my decision making and again you know I I made myself jobless and homeless um, and I booked a ticket to to go to the Hook of Holland and I remember this journey, like so many other poignant experiences I had, I remember this journey very well. You know, I, I, I get onto the boat from Harwich and I'm sailing across the channel. And I remember seeing the hook of Holland in the distance and the American roulette table was closing and all I had in my person, in, in my whole entirety was 60 euros. So here I am, you know, I'm in a situation whereby I've I've experienced my big win. I've lost lots of all my big win and more. I decide I've had enough. I make myself jobless and homeless, and I book a ticket and I go to Hook of Holland and I end up spending all all of what money I did have, you know, for the trip on the American roulette table. And here I am, you know, I'm about to book dock in a foreign country in the, with the language that I don't know, jobless and homeless and penniless and We've all got our uh, what we call war stories, um, and I'm sure many listeners will have far more distressing and harrowing um, stories than, than what I can tell. But the reason why I tell this story of all the stories that, uh, that I have is because, you know, this experience marks the end of my 
early formative years, you know, and kind of like signals the 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 the, the next chapter of my journey. And uh, yeah, so 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 with that, I I I I spend two or three weeks in Holland, and it was not a nice time because it was cold and language barrier was really difficult and being homeless in a foreign country was was altogether a different experience and not not easy i managed to spend i managed to get some money from the british embassy and they gave me some money to get a bus you know back to the uk and that's what i did and and arrived in a place called canterbury in east kent i don't know if some of your listeners are from east kent um, in canterbury but it's a really nice part of the country and um so that's where that's where i landed you know and that's where i was for the next seven or eight years and those seven years in canterbury were were challenging and difficult for a whole range of reasons given that that my childhood years formed the basis of teenage my teenage years and i always look look upon my teenage years as the, the foundation the basis for my for my early 20s and so yeah, there's lots of chaos and yeah, I, I, I'll share that with you now.